Your lecturer is Dr. Indre Viscontis. Dr. Viscontis is a cognitive neuroscience affiliate at the Memory and Aging Center at the University of California, San Francisco, and holds a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from the University of California, Los Angeles. In addition, she is a member of the collegiate faculty at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Dr. Viscontis has published more than 35 book chapters and papers related to the neural basis of memory and creativity. Defying traditional career boundaries, she also performs as an opera singer and is a regular soloist with several chamber music groups. Dr. Viscontis co-hosted the documentary series Miracle Detectives and has appeared on The Oprah Winfrey Show. She currently co-hosts Inquiring Minds, a popular science podcast. Welcome. I'm Indre Viscontis. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and an opera singer. I use neuroscience to help musicians develop effective practice strategies, and I perform music to explore how people connect with each other through art. And I try to help everyone appreciate the great value of science. Take a moment to think about our universe as if it were a grand operatic production a coherent theatrical experience made up of many moving parts. There's an orchestra of musicians, an elaborate set and many props, singers in beautiful costumes who tell a fascinating story, lighting that creates the illusion of being in a specific place, stagehands and electricians behind the scenes, and a conductor who keeps everyone in time. It's truly a great production, so we happily suspend disbelief and lose ourselves in the story. The opera gives us a multi-sensory, coherent, emotionally moving experience. Somehow, it becomes greater than the sum of its many parts. But it is a production of a kind. Your brain performs it every second of every day. It breaks different aspects of the world apart, codes and processes them using different cells, mixes them with memories and some rough guesswork. And yet, you experience life as an integrated, continuous journey. How does your brain accomplish this feat? To tell you the truth, we don't really know, but we're trying to find out. Herein lies the excitement and power of science, we search for answers to life's most profound questions, not to reduce or detract from the artistry and wonder of creation, but to enhance our appreciation of the universe and improve our lives. Science seeks general principles that describe our world. Art transforms personal experiences to illuminate what's universal. Ultimately, as I see it, their goals are pretty much the same. To understand the universe and our place in it, and to use this knowledge to enrich our existence, reduce suffering, and change our world for the better. I actively pursue both approaches, and I love the way each constantly informs the other. In this course, we'll explore 12 of the most important concepts of modern science. Many of them, since their inception, have been relegated to separate disciplines. But in fact, much like the way our brain cells work together, they're all closely linked, with each one playing an important role in our understanding of the world. What I want to share with you is the thrilling promise of science, how it can provide us with the bedrock of knowledge upon which we can build, harness, and improve whatever we can imagine. I think you'll see that there's a real artistry to it as well. So let's jump right in with one of the big questions we've all pondered at some point. What is the meaning of life? We seek answers everywhere, from the great works of literature to the most complicated mathematical theories of quantum physics. But despite our best efforts to find an answer, 
the meaning of life remains an open question, in part because simply defining life is surprisingly difficult. How would you define it? Remember that your definition will have to capture things that are very small and simple, like an amoeba or a bacterium, as well as the largest and most complex creatures, like humans and blue whales. But don't forget that we also have to encompass things that don't move on their own, like trees and moss and strawberries. So what if instead of superficial features, we defined life in terms of its properties? Things that grow, reproduce, and consume energy. But many properties of living things also occur in inanimate objects. Mountains grow and recede, ocean currents move, fire consumes energy. So what defines the border between the animate and the inanimate? And why should we care to define something so precious and diverse? Well, there are lots of instances in which distinguishing the living from the non-living has important ethical implications. If we create a sentient robot that feels emotions and seems to have consciousness, is it moral to turn it off or destroy it? If we use bioengineering to enhance our bodies or cure diseases, do we treat the tissues with any special care if they come from living things versus artificially created ones? The arguments for using stem cells in research or when to limit abortions are all affected by how we define life. Intuitively, we think we know what's alive and what isn't. A stuffed animal is inanimate, but a live cat is animate. A computer, though it can signal to other computers and sustain itself by automatically updating software or recharging its batteries, is still inanimate. Whereas a person in a coma who can no longer signal or self-sustain remains alive, as does a child who needs parents to teach him how to communicate with others and feed himself. But let's take a moment to think some more about what separates the animate from the inanimate. In the 17th century, the idea that living organisms are fundamentally different from non-living entities because they contain some non-physical element emerged, and it remained popular amongst philosophers and scientists up until the 19th century. This philosophy is called vitalism, the belief that the stuff of life is not found in matter, but in something else. Supporters of vitalism suggest that there is a vital spark, energy, or élan vital, that distinguishes the inanimate from the animate. Intuitively, this notion feels satisfying, particularly now that we've agreed that defining life is a challenge. But finding that elusive spark has proven to be just as difficult. Chemists classify matter into two kinds, organic and inorganic. All living things are made up of organic compounds, combinations of molecules containing only a handful of elements carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen being the main players. By definition, an organic compound is simply one whose molecules contain carbon, an admittedly fairly arbitrary distinction. But it is curious that all living things contain carbon. And for a long time, vitalists hung on to the notion that only living things can create organic substances. One of the first blows to vitalism came in 1828 when German chemist Friedrich Wohler first synthesized an organic compound, urea, a constituent of urine, from inorganic components. At that time, vitalists maintained that organic material is separable from inorganic material and that we can't create the elements of life from inorganic compounds alone. But once Vola demonstrated that an organic substance could be generated from inorganic ingredients, the field of organic chemistry blossomed. Though the idea that life was infused with some sort of vital force continued to permeate the thinking of many renowned scientists and thinkers. Some hold on to this idea even today. But I think it's safe to say that most contemporary scientists recognize that there is nothing fundamentally different between the elements that comprise animate and inanimate things. 
So we come to the idea that life should be defined by its properties and not the materials from which they are made. Okay, so what are these properties? Well, first, they too can be divided into two categories, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic properties refer to internally driven actions, that is, from the thing itself, whereas extrinsic properties involve the interactions of the thing with its environment. Let's start with the fundamental intrinsic properties. These include organization, growth, and reproduction. All things that we've ever identified as living are composed of one or more cells, which are the building blocks of life. And they are highly organized, even if they are single-celled organisms. They grow by increasing in size rather than by simply swallowing other matter. A lake can get bigger if it rains or if there's runoff from some other water source, but the baby in my uterus started as two cells and now is literally growing by himself, creating new cells and organizing them into organs, limbs, and other body parts. All I do is provide him with some nutrients and his nervous system and cells do the rest. And living things are capable of reproduction, of producing new individual organisms, either asexually from a single parent or sexually from two parents. Living organisms also interact with their environments in characteristic ways or have certain extrinsic properties. They transform energy by converting chemicals into cellular components. They regulate their internal environments. They adapt over time in response to their environments and they respond to stimuli or changes in their surroundings. Even my fetus responds to certain conditions by kicking me in the ribs or punching my bladder, much to my delight, of course. Do all of these properties serve as an adequate definition of life, however? Not entirely, since some inanimate objects can show many of these properties too. Okay. What's another way to define it then? Chemistry isn't the whole story either, since we can build machines from biological parts. So where does that leave us? Life is a complicated concept, and when faced with complexity, scientists start by pulling apart the layers and considering one component at a time. And as we'll see, each of these methods, examining the properties of living things and analyzing their chemical makeup, is useful in different circumstances as a way of understanding what makes life special. Science functions by fun finding converging lines of evidence to support ideas, following many different paths towards a comprehensive solution. And it's often useful to start with the parts and build up from there. So to understand what life is, let's start with a closer look at the chemistry of living organisms. Despite the incredible diversity on Earth, the chemistry of life can be broken down into two critical items, water and carbon. Water is the molecule that supports all life, and carbon is an element that every molecule of life contains. All of the living organisms that we're familiar with are mostly water. About three quarters of the Earth is covered by water. We now know that life on Earth started in the water and for the first three billion years of evolution stayed there. Most cells are surrounded by water and even cells themselves are 70 to 95% water. Bathed in water, the stuff of life is laced with carbon, which is uniquely capable of forming large, complex and diverse molecules. Other elements such as hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus are also common in organic compounds, but it's carbon that takes the starring role. So what makes water and carbon so special, and why are those the chosen elements of life? To answer that question, we need to look more carefully at the structure and properties of these two fundamental components of life. Let's start with water. Water is a simple molecule made up of two hydrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom. On its own, the water molecule looks like a fat V with the two hydrogen atoms both bonded to a larger oxygen atom in the middle. Now, 
Oxygen has more negatively charged electrons than hydrogen, and the bonds between the elements are single covalent bonds, chemical bonds involving the sharing of electrons between atoms, that make the molecule slightly negative near the oxygen atom and slightly positive near the hydrogen atoms. This configuration makes the molecule polar, meaning that the overall charge is unevenly distributed across it. It has poles, just like a magnet. The life-giving properties of water stem from the fact that there are attractions between oppositely charged atoms of different water molecules. So the hydrogen atoms of one water molecule are attracted to the oxygen atom in another. This attraction between molecules creates weak bonds that can form, break, and reform very fast and very often. The ability of water to organize and reorganize its molecules into a higher level of order provides the basis for four key emergent properties that explain its life-sustaining quality. These are cohesion, temperature moderation, solvency, and expansion. Cohesion results from the weak hydrogen bonds that hold water molecules together. This structure allows cells to transport nutrients and other molecules against the pull of gravity in plants and in animals. To illustrate this amazing property, let's think about how water from the ground in a forest can travel all the way up the trunk of the tallest tree. This gravity-defying feat starts at the leaves where water evaporates on the surface. As one molecule shifts from its liquid to its gaseous state, hydrogen bonds tug on the next molecule in the tree's water-conducting veins. This one tugs on the next one and so on, all the way down to the roots at the source of water. The architecture of trees also takes advantage of capillary action, exploiting the forces acting on water in narrow tubes. Capillary action is a combination of the cohesive nature of water molecules and the adhesive forces between the water and its surroundings. Speaking of evaporation, let's turn to temperature moderation next. We all know that when we get overheated, we cool our body temperature by sweating. How does this work? Our bodies are mainly made up of water, and when water is heated, the molecules move faster. It's the fastest moving molecules that vaporize, turning from liquid to gas. A hot cup of tea evaporates relatively quickly. You can even see the molecules steaming into the air. But as the tea cools, the rate of evaporation decreases. Fewer molecules are moving fast enough to turn into a gas. As liquid turns to gas, the surface of the liquid left behind gets cooler because the fastest molecules have vaporized. When the hottest molecules leave the water, the ones that are left behind are by definition cooler. On a hot day, we sweat to release the hottest molecules of water from our bodies, leaving the water in our bodies in a cooler state. In fact, water is the only compound on our planet that can exist in all three states, solid, liquid, and gas, within the temperature ranges that characterize our world. No other compound would be able to help us regulate our temperature in our environment the way that water can. Now, if you've ever tasted your sweat, you know it's salty. This taste test is evidence for the fact that water is an excellent solvent. That is, many substances that are placed in water dissolve. Nothing works better than water at dissolving many different substances. Yet, critically, there are organic compounds that don't dissolve in water like fats. This is why the outer walls of cells are made up of lipids, or fats. If the cell walls dissolved in water, we'd be in big trouble, with the contents of our cells spilling out willy-nilly. Substances are classified into two categories when it comes to their relationship with water. They are either hydrophilic or water-loving, such as other polar molecules that interact with the weak positive and negative poles of water molecules, or they're hydrophobic or water-fearing, like oils that don't dissolve in water. In fact, they seem to repel it. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, one final amazing property of water is that it, it exists in all three physical states, liquid, solid, and gas, in the natural world. 
And even more rare is the fact that water is less dense as a solid than as a liquid. Ice floats. Most other compounds contract and increase in density in their solid states. Water, never one to follow the crowd, expands with fewer molecules per square inch in the solid state than in the liquid state. Because ice floats, we can keep living here on Earth. If water became more dense with solidification, ice would sink, and eventually all the bodies of water on our planet would freeze solid. How would we survive such a harsh environment? But because ice floats, it insulates the liquid water below the surface, preventing it from freezing and continuing to provide a rich environment for fish, plants, and other living things. So what do these qualities of water tell us about life? Can they help us set the boundary between the living and the non-living? Does water enable life to have some of the very properties that define it? The fact that it exists in all three states, solid, liquid, and gas, means that many different life forms can take advantage of it, depending on their environments, and they can use this property of water to regulate their own temperature. Its ability to dissolve many different compounds while leaving other compounds unaffected gives life forms many options in terms of how to use water to perform basic functions. And the ability of water to defy gravity using its cohesive force enables living things to adapt their architecture in order to exploit this property. So perhaps water is one component that has made the diversity of life a possibility. And by being so versatile, it also gives life forms a chance to adapt to surroundings and survive in the face of major changes. Water might be one key to the diversity, adaptability, resilience, and proliferation of life. All characteristics that seem to define the very essence of what it means to be alive. If water supports life, then carbon, arguably, is life. The name carbon comes from the Latin word for coal, which is composed primarily of carbon. But so are diamonds, the hardest substance on Earth, and graphite, soft enough to write with, none of which are living things. Carbon is a chemical element that has four valence electrons in its outer shell, electrons that it can share with other elements, making it possible for carbon to be the centerpiece in an almost infinite number of molecules. Carbon is ubiquitous in living organisms because it's compatible with many other elements and because it can form complex chains with other carbon atoms. These chains are called carbon skeletons and form the backbones of most organic molecules. The wide variety of shapes which the chains can form underlies the diversity of organic compounds and therefore of life itself. For example, carbon chains can vary in length from very short to very long. They can be branched or unbranched. They can even form rings. These different skeletons provide the scaffold for innumerable types of organic compounds. Now, we classify organic compounds into four general categories. Amino acids, which make up proteins. Nucleic acids, the building blocks of DNA, our genetic code. Carbohydrates, such as sugars, starches, and cellulose, which is what cotton and wood are largely made of. And lipids, fats and hormones. Carbohydrates fuel our cells in the form of glucose and serve as the building materials by strengthening plant cell walls and exoskeletons. Hydrophobic lipids, or fats, are also an important energy source and form the cell walls in animals. As hormones, they are widely used as signals throughout the body, like insulin, which tells your liver muscles and, and fat to take in glucose from your blood and use it as fuel. Proteins are made up of chains of amino acids and are truly the nuts and bolts of the cell. We'll turn to the variety of functions, and functions that they perform in the last section of this lecture. Finally, nucleic acids in the form of DNA and RNA store, transmit, and express the genetic code. These four different categories represent both the incredible diversity and the adaptability of carbon-based compounds. With the same building blocks of elements, the entire catalog of living things can be created. How is this possible? 
To answer that question, we need to look more closely at one particular type of carbon compound, proteins. The organic compounds that enable cells to survive, reproduce, adapt, consume energy, fight enemies, self-regulate, and every other function that seems to characterize life. In this era of body consciousness and Atkins diets, we're often told that we need to consume protein and limit carbohydrates. For most people, protein is synonymous with healthy eating and building muscle mass. And indeed, each cell in our bodies works hard to design, manufacture, store, and transport proteins. But what makes protein so special? Let's answer this question by talking about the different types of proteins that our bodies need and how they're manufactured. First off, it's not an exaggeration to say that nearly everything our cells do involves proteins. The name protein comes from the Greek meaning first or primary, which is an indication of the central role that proteins play in animal and plant life. If you take away water, 50% of the cell's mass now comes from proteins. So what's a protein? Well, to answer that question, we first need to understand what proteins are made of, amino acids. Okay, what's an amino acid? An amino acid is a molecular compound that has a distinctive chemical structure. At its very center is a carbon atom. And we know that carbon has four possible bonds that can be filled with other atoms or compounds. In amino acids, three of these bonds are always the same. What distinguishes one amino acid from another is what's attached to the fourth bond. Despite the wide array of different kinds of proteins, all of them are made up of some combination of the same 20 amino acids. A string of amino acids is called a peptide. And strings of peptides are called polypeptides, poly meaning many. A protein is a molecule made of one or more polypeptides, or strings of amino acids, that's folded into a particular three-dimensional structure. Now this 3D structure is very important because the successful function of a protein depends on its shape. So polypeptide, the chain of amino acids, is not itself a synonym for protein. The polypeptide needs to be folded proper, properly or else it won't work. Think of a flat sheet of paper as a polypeptide. When you crumple it into a ball, it's still made of paper, but the shape is different. You now have pockets and loops and ridges in the structure. All proteins have specific spaces on their surface where they interact with other cellular components. That's why the 3D structure is so important. It enables these vital interactions. Within our bodies, we house tens of thousands of different proteins with different shapes and functions. Proteins are the most complex molecules known to man, and there's an entire industry devoted to sorting out their three-dimensional shapes. In fact, even the video game industry has gotten involved, with thousands of non-scientist gamers spending countless hours folding virtual proteins. Almost every protein works by recognizing and binding to some other molecule, so if the shape is off, it can't function. For example, Antibodies are proteins that protect us from foreign substances like viruses that can harm our cells. An antibody functions by binding to a flu virus, for example, and letting the body know that it should be destroyed. You can imagine this binding like putting a key into a lock. The structure of one section of the antibody is a mirror image of one section of the virus. That's why we often can't get the same viral illness twice our body has created antibodies that are specific to that virus. This is also how vaccines work. They encourage the body to create antibodies specific to the viruses that are in the vaccine, but there's such a small amount of the virus in the vaccine that the vaccine itself doesn't make us sick. Many proteins are tasked with the job of speeding up chemical reactions as catalysts. These proteins are called enzymes, and they can perform their duties over and over again, making them the true worker bees in the cell. Other proteins help our cells store important molecules for later use, or transport them around the body, or aid in the communication between cells, or coordinate activity between different organs, as hormones do in our bodies, or provide structural support like keratin does in our hair and nails. 
Without protein, life would be impossible. How has this knowledge informed our ability to define life? Have we come any closer to understanding what it means to be alive? Perhaps a little. By breaking down life into its components, we can begin to grasp what makes it so special. We intuitively know that it's different and worth protecting, but without understanding what exactly makes it special, it's hard to make the right ethical decisions that our technological advances require. If we reassembled the right ingredients, could we create life ourselves? And if we could, should we? Can non-carbon-based objects ever be considered alive? What if we infused carbon-based organisms with inorganic parts? Where is the boundary between a bionic living thing and an artificial one made up of biological bits? What are our responsibilities when it comes to artificial life? If we create cyborgs with feelings, do we need to limit their suffering? If we engineer life, is it distinct from life that evolves on its own? Most of these questions remain unanswerable so far, but in order to answer them, we need to continue to examine the layers of life and science can help us draw boundaries that enable us to shape our policy decisions as our technology advances and the line between the living and the non-living gets progressively more blurry. And that's the beauty of science. Asking one question raises more questions and sparks our curiosity by deepening our thinking and helping us formulate another, better, and more interesting question. An artist told, once told Richard Feynman, the great physicist, that he pities scientists for they can't simply appreciate the beauty of a flower, but must take it apart until it becomes just a dull thing. Feynman replied, although I may not be quite as refined aesthetically as the artist, I can appreciate the beauty of a flower. At the same time, I can see much more about the flower than he sees. I can imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions inside, which also have a beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty at this dimension at one centimeter, there's also beauty at smaller dimensions, the inner structure, the processes. The fact that the colors in the flower evolved in order to attract insects to pollinate it is interesting. It means that insects can see color. It adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense also exist in the lower forms? Why is it aesthetic? All kinds of interesting questions which scientific knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. It only adds. I don't understand how it subtracts. I feel the same way. As both an artist and a scientist, I marvel every day at how these complementary approaches inform each other. Neither one is more or less worthwhile, and both science and art help us see the precious nature of human experience. So to add to our excitement and awe about the mysterious universe, let's now turn to the next lecture in which we move on to explore the properties of life in greater detail by considering its intricate organization.